are sons of God with power. Raise your head and say it loud. The righteousness of God is ours. Of our sonship we are proud. We're bought back from the devil's power. We're set apart by Christ. We're reconciling men to God. Serving them the bread of life. We are sons of God with power. Raise your head and say it loud. The righteousness of God is ours. Of our sonship we are proud. We're bought back from the devil's power. We're set apart by Christ. We're reconciling men to God. Serving them the bread of life. We're reconciling men to God. Serving them the bread of life. Well, God bless you. Thank you. I wrote last week to uh, Reverend and Mrs. Larry Panarello and invited them to come spend the weekend with us on our June 4th event. And they graciously accepted our invitation and lovingly replied to me. Connie said, we need our Nick and Kim fix for the year. <laughs> so we were talking a little bit through emails, and she had said to me that uh, this time that they decided to drive up uh, from Indiana, right, mm -hmm. instead of fly, because they wanted to take their time and, you know, leave several days earlier and stop along the, the way, and her words to me were that they wanted to stop and smell the roses along the way. Mm. Unaware that her words would inspire the title of our teaching this morning, and that is Smell the Roses, and it's subtitled Be Thankful. Be Thankful. In 1962, Four Soviet submarines went on a mission only known to a few Communist Party officials. Their destination was a mystery, and it was to be revealed once they were at sea. Under their orders, each submarine would travel 7,000 miles from a top-secret naval base in the Arctic Circle across the Atlantic, and they would be permanently stationed in Mariel, Cuba, where they would serve as the vanguard of a Soviet force that was 90 miles from mainland America. The commanders of each submarine had permission to act without direct orders from Moscow if they believed that they were under a threat. Each of the four subs was carrying what the Soviets called a special weapon. It was a single nuclear torpedo comparable in strength to the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And if you know anything about Hiroshima or Hiroshima, you know that there was millions of people that were affected long term. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives. Tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, was damage was done. And it was not a good thing. The torpedo could be fired only if the captain and the political officer were in agreement. Each one of them had half a key. And when joined, this would unlock the firing mechanism in the torpedo. In October 1962, the world teetered on the brink of nuclear war. After reviewing photographic evidence, President John F. Kennedy informed the world that the Soviet Union was building secret missile bases in Cuba, just 90 miles off the shores of Florida. For the next 13 days, the world held its breath as the Soviet Union and the United States confronted each other about the missiles stationed in Cuba. While politicians sought a revolution, uh, a resolution to the standoff, 
no one at that time was aware of the events that were taking place inside the submarine B-59 off the waters of the coast of Florida. Vasily Arkhipov was born in January 30th, 1926, to a poor peasant family near Moscow. At the age of 16, he began his education at the Pacific Higher Naval School. Vasily was the first of his family to join. He saw his first action in a mind-sweeping event in the Pacific Theater at the tail end of World War II. In 1947, he graduated from Caspian Higher Naval School when he served on submarines in the Soviet Black Sea, Northern and Baltic fleets. In 1961, Vasilya got his first taste of crisis management in an incident that, while extremely monumentous, wasn't even close to what he would deal with later. This first incident happened when Vasilya was appointed deputy commander of the new K-19 nuclear submarine known today as the Widowmaker. It was one of the Soviet Union's first nuclear subs. It was also equipped with a nuclear ballistic missile. On July 4th, 1961, as the sub was conducting exercises near Greenland, a major leak was discovered in the radiant cooling system. Since no backup cooling system was installed pre-sale, the reactor on the sub was in real danger of a nuclear meltdown. In order to prevent a nuclear accident, unlike the world had never seen before, the captain of the sub sent workers into high radiated areas to build a cooling system on the spot. Every member of the sub did what they could to prevent disaster. Vasilia, leading, uh, lending his engineering expertise, helped contain the overheating reactor. The crew did succeed, but not before these workers and many of the crew developed radiation sickness. Every worker that was sent as a first responder into the high radiation areas died within days. Due to this, a mutiny nearly broke out aboard the K-19 sub. Vasilia backed his captain in continuing the work and was eventually awarded a medal for his bravery in the time of a crisis and his loyalty to the Soviet Union. All of this, though, was only a precursor to what Arkhipov would experience later on. So these are men of war. These are soldiers. These are men that are taught to do a job and taught obedience and taught discipline. And when you're placed in a situation where you have to make a call, that's what your training dictates. But a great man of war, great men also have a conscience. They also have a higher power, many of them. They also serve a God, and many of them are Christians. After his time on the K-19 sub, Vasilio was made second in command on the B-59, one of the four attack submarines that was ordered to travel to Cuba on October 1st, 1962. The sub contained 22 torpedoes, one of them which was nuclear. That's the torpedo there, the CCCP. That's the nuclear warhead. The other torpedoes were loaded. This one was not. That particular torpedo held the same strength as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The captains of each of the four subs were given permission to fire their nuclear torpedoes at their own discretion, so long as they had the backing of the political officer on board. Unknown to the crew of the B-59, the United States began their naval blockade of Cuba on October 24th and informed the Soviets that they would be dropping practice depth charges, warning shots, so that any subs in the area must surface and be identified. Moscow could not communicate this information to the B-59. 
due to it being underwater for so long and it couldn't receive radio transmission. On October 27, 1962, destroyers and the aircraft carrier, the USS Randolph, located the sub, trapped it, and began dropping depth charges to force it to surface. The sub's crew, which had been traveling for nearly four weeks with very little communication from Moscow, was very, very tired. And temperatures aboard the submarine would reach into the 120 degrees. The carbon monoxide level on the submarine, because the air purifiers weren't working properly, was also extremely high. So the men were very fatigued. They were beat up. They were just wasted. They were pushed to their limit and then some. The sub's captain, Valentin Stavinsky, believed that nuclear war had already broken out between the Soviet Union and the United States and wanted to fire the nuclear torpedo. Because all he heard was these depth charges. He wasn't aware of anything else. And so he got a hold of the political officer on board and they both agreed that we should fire the nuclear torpedo. Fortunately, given the heightened tension at this time, one other person had veto power over firing the sub, uh, over firing the torpedo be besides the captain and the political officer. The second in command was Vasilya Arkhipov. Vasilya, despite being the second in command on the B-59, was the leader of the four subs of the Soviet fleet. Had Arkhipov not been present, a nuclear war would have likely happened, being as both the captain and political officer wanted to launch the nuclear torpedo. I won't tell you how much damage that would have done, right? Okay. And what chain of events it would have set off. Vasilya vehemently dis disagreed, arguing that since no orders had come from Moscow in a long time, such a drastic action would be ill-advised and the sub should surface so they could make contact with Moscow. A heated argument broke out. Legend has it that punches were thrown. Eventually, though, Vasilio won the day. His reputation as a hero on the K-19 mutiny reportedly helped in the debate and the submarine surfaced and they surfaced to an American fleet. Upon meeting the Americans, they were instructed to head back to Russia. They obliged. They ran into mechanical issues on board the sub and at one point headed east. Nuclear war was adverted. Vasily Arkhipov was again a hero. When the sub arrived back in Russia, the crew of the B-59 was met with trepidation. After all, they had pretty much surrendered to the Americans. One of the Russian admirals said to the submariners, it would have been better if you had gone down with your ship. That's easy for that fat right. ASS to say, right. which most of those guys are when they get that high, by the way. Mm -hmm. They forget where they came from. Despite the not-so-hero welcome he originally received from the Soviets upon his return to his wife, Olga, she said, Vasilya was always my hero. Vasilya Arkhipov died as a vice rear admiral on August 19, 1998, from complications of liver cancer caused by radiation poisoning from his exposure on the K-19. You really don't know what goes on in the world today. And your problems, or so you think your problems, are really minuscule to the reality of what could really happen. And when you understand some of these things, it should make you thankful for the life that you have and for the protection that God has afforded us. The morning that that was happening, a U-2 spy plane traveled and went out of Alaskan air space inadvertently and crossed over into Russian airspace. The pilot of the plane was flying by celestial markers and not radar. But what had happened was the Aurora Borealis was so bright it blinded him and he lost his way. 
Russia dispatched several MiGs to shoot the plane down. That was the morning that all this happened. They got on the phone, there was a lot of conversation, and two F-9s, I think, were dispatched, and they guided it from American with nuclear-tipped missiles, and they were able to guide the spy plane back into Alaska. By this time, the plane had run out of gas, and the pilot was able to stop and get back, and nothing happened there. And then a few hours later, this happened. And who knows what October 27th is? It's my birthday. <laughs> right? And that's an amazing thing. You can talk to God about that. I don't know. <laughs> Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foul snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. That includes COVID. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Okay. And so you got to sit back and you got to take a deep breath and you got to wonder about what you're going through. And in comparison, does it really deserve all the anguish and aggravation that you're putting yourself through? And you got to slow down sometimes, like Connie told me, and smell the roses along the way. Because one day you're going to wake up, you're going to be looking in the mirror, and your life's going to be over, and then it's going to be too late. Psalm 46 one says, God is our refuge and strength of very present help in trouble. Psalm 62, verse 7 says, In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. And that's true. He's our rock. He's our strength. And when we look to him and we depend on him, he'll protect us. And he'll protect us when we don't even know we need protecting. Right? This world hangs on a thread sometimes. And you know, Democrat, Republican, they're all nuts how they, our God could keep us safe so his word can be spoken to the next generation. And if the Lord tarried that, that would carry on to the generation after that. Psalm 50 verse 14 says, Offer unto God, what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And pay thy vows unto the Most High. Is he worthy of your thanksgiving for some of the things that go on and some of the things that you don't realize go on? And are you going to pay your vows? The vows that you made to him, the vows that he's called you to, and the gifts that he's given you. Don't ignore those gifts. Don't ignore that calling. Don't ignore God. He's worthy of your thanksgiving, and he's worthy of your love. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is what? He's good. For his mercy endureth. How long? We all need his mercy, right? Yes. And finally, Psalm 118, verse 24 says, This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Take each day, one day at a time, and along the way, make sure you take time to smell the roses. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. And for all the incredible things that you do that we don't have a clue. Thank you, Lord, that we can slow our lives down and just take time to be grateful, love one another, and smell the roses along the way. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We are sons of God with power. Raise your hand and say it loud. The righteousness of God is ours, of our sonship we are proud, we're bought back from the devil's power. 
This video is a presentation of Chapter and Verse Ministry, a practical research and teaching ministry. Our website is cvm.church, or you can call us at 610-650-8449. And thank you very much for your patronage. 